Silver, will it boom again or continue to crash? I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's quickly go over the backstory. Most of us know this. Got a chart of GameStop going back to the 22nd all the way to the 1st. Got some updates today, though. <laughs> we'll go over that in just a minute. Goes from 50 bucks all the way to $450. Back in on the 22nd, remember this on the chart looked like a boom. This looked like it was going parabolic. It does come back down, goes up slightly, and then it just goes completely nuts all the way up to 496 at one point, which I saw. I think that was on a one minute chart. But then the exact same day, in fact, just hours later, it completely collapses down to $120 and then continues with the volatility. Lately, what we've seen, and especially today, is the stock really just go down in a straight line, which is pretty much expected. The other day when I did a video on this, I got a lot of pushback because I said, guys, listen, this is just a game of musical chairs. And at some point in time, the music is going to stop. And a lot of people in the comments said, no, George, it's not going to happen. This time it's different because we're on a mission and we don't care if we lose money. I had a lot of those people in the comments. Well, I hope that's true because they are definitely losing a ton of money today. What ends up happening usually when there's so much emotion involved is the average Joe gets in at the wrong time. And I'm not here to say that I'm against the average Joe. I'm for the average Joe and Jane. But if you look back through history, unfortunately, they let their emotions get the best of them. They usually buy at this point because they're considering it back here. They kind of hear about it. Then by the time they get to here, they see everyone making all this money and all the stories of someone turning $20,000 into a hundred million or whatever it is. And they say, I got to get in on the action. They buy here, they buy here. Then when it crashes down, they're not holding through the volatility. They get frustrated. They get worried. They're losing sleep. They sell at the bottom. It goes back up. They may buy again here and just goes back down. So they continue to buy at top, sell at bottoms until they just lose everything. But let's look at silver back to the 26 all the way to the first on the left. We go from 25 up to 29. And according to the Internet, and I know this may or may not be true, but regardless, the bottom line is because of the hype in GameStop, I don't know whether the Wall Street bet guys started to focus on silver or it was just in the media and then there was this frenzy with the retail investor. Who knows why? But the bottom line is because of all the hype with what was going on here, silver started to get a bid because everyone started to talk about a short squeeze. And we're going to get into the mechanics of how it works with silver because it's different than GameStop. Very important you understand how this works. We'll get into that in step number two. Over the weekend, well, it went up on the 28th and flatlined over the weekend. No real trading until Sunday night. And then it just goes parabolic up to almost $30. And it comes down to 28 when I checked it today, all the way down to $26.80 roughly. So looking back, we see that the volatility in GameStop was absolutely tremendous. Maybe historic, something we may never see again, going up. 1,500% almost from where it was here. And daily, it would go up 100% plus. Got to remember, this draws in a lot of those retail people. And although some people argue that it wasn't about the money, it was about sending a message. I totally get it. But it does draw in a lot of average Joes that really aren't in it for the cause. They're in it to make a quick buck. And then silver just to compare and contrast the two, up about 15%, at least it was up about 15% from where it was maybe five days ago, a week or so. And then on yesterday, it went up by 8%, which seems like nothing compared to GameStop. But it is a strong move 
for silver. So the question becomes for everyone holding silver now, is it going to 500? Is it going to see a move like GameStop? In other words, is silver right about here on the chart or maybe even here? Because remember, back in the 22nd, GameStop went up by 50, 60% here and came back down, retraced before it went on this parabolic move. So is silver basically right here on the GameStop chart or is it potentially right here where it's going to continue to crash down maybe 25, 20, even 15? This is what we need to figure out by understanding the mechanics of really what went on here and what's going on here with the futures market. Step number two, silver pricing secrets revealed. Let's go over how the futures market works for commodities so you can determine the probabilities of silver booming again, just like GameStop, or continuing to crash like we've seen GameStop do today. <laughs> we saw that in step number one. It starts off with the actual commodity being produced. Imagine that, the real economy. None of this financial economy shenanigans where we're just doing all this financial engineering and selling paper back and forth. The Wall Street Casino, we'll call it. We've got Farmer Fred, and he's chewing on his little piece of wheat with his some sort of gardening tool. And he grows, oh, I guess he grows wheat. <laughs> That's what he's chewing on. And he has eight bushels of wheat. Well, he needs to sell his wheat in the future to Baker Bob. So the price can fluctuate dramatically. They come to an agreed upon price. So in one month, we'll call it March 1st, Farmer Fred goes into a contractual agreement, a futures contract with Baker Bob to deliver three bushels of wheat at $10 a bushel. So the contract value is $30 in total. Both of them are happy because it's a price they can agree on. So regardless of what happens to the price, they both have terms that work well for their business. But unfortunately, like I said earlier, we have a financial economy as well. And because of the Fed and the government and things that we'll go over in step number three, the financial economy is significantly larger than the real economy. Here's what I mean in the futures market. We have JP Morgan and we'll say Goldman Sachs, everyone's favorite banksters. <laughs> and JP Morgan says, listen, Goldman Sachs, we'll sell you 1,000 bushels of wheat on March 1st for $10,000. Because remember, it's $10 per bushel. And Goldman Sachs says, okay, we'll go ahead and take that bet. Because basically that's what it is. They're just betting. It's a, it's a casino. They're betting because the thousand bushels of wheat doesn't even exist. Remember, there's only eight bushels of wheat that Farmer Fred has grown. We'll say he's the only farmer in the world <laughs> that grows wheat. So Goldman Sachs takes the bet. They take the contract. That's kind of on their balance sheet now. Although the transaction hasn't occurred, they've got the contractual agreement. So technically, that thousand bushels of wheat goes on to their balance sheet as an asset. In JP Morgan, that $10,000 that's agreed upon would go onto their balance sheet. Now, let's say when we get to March 1st, the price of wheat has gone up to $12 a bushel. And even before, well, JP Morgan would say, my goodness gracious, we can't deliver the wheat to Goldman Sachs. They most likely don't even want it. So we're going to have to buy those contracts from the market. Let's say this is the entire market just to keep things simple. So JP Morgan would have to buy those thousand bushels of wheat from Goldman Sachs. They'd have to buy that contract back. Well, if the price has gone up by $2, JP Morgan would have to send Goldman Sachs $12,000 for those thousand bushels of wheat they sold them in the first place. That would be a net loss to JP Morgan of $2,000 
and a gain of $2,000 to Goldman Sachs. So you see, there's no wheat going back and forth. They're not taking delivery. They're just kind of making side bets on what will happen to the price of wheat in the real economy. But I want to be clear, they've got a few different options when they get to this expiration date. They can just buy the thousand bushels back or the contracts from the open market to close out their position, or they could do that in addition to selling more bushels of wheat into the future. So they're rolling the contract over, but they'd still realize the loss, that's very important. And that's what makes it significantly different than selling stock. You don't have a hard deadline when you have to buy those shares back. Or lastly, they could go ahead and try to deliver on the contract, either the wheat or a lump sum of money that would be equivalent to the value of the wheat to be delivered, all based on the contract. To understand this even better, let's go right to the internet and check out a short video from the CME Group. Futures contracts have a limited lifespan. When you trade futures, you need to be aware of expiration dates as this will influence the outcome of the trades and your exit strategy. There are two expiration-related terms that are particularly important. First is expiration, and the second is rollover. A contract's expiration date is the last day that a trader can trade that contract. This can occur on the third Friday of the expiration month, but varies by contract. Prior to expiration, a futures trader has three options. Offset the position to fully close out the trade, roll the contract from the current or forward month to a future expiration date, or to let the contract expire and take delivery. Offsetting or liquidating a position is the simplest and most common method of exiting a trade. When offsetting a position, a trader is able to realize all profits or losses associated with that position without taking physical or cash delivery on the asset. To offset a position, a trader must make an opposite and equal transaction to offset the trade. For example, a trader who is short two contracts of WTI crude oil expiring in September will need to buy two contracts of WTI crude oil expiring on the same date. The difference in price between his initial positions and the offset positions will represent the profit or loss on the trade. Rollover is when a trader moves his position from the front month contract to a month further out in the future. Traders will determine when they need to move the new contract by watching the volume of both the expiring contract and the next expiring contract month. A trader who decides to roll their position may do so at any time before expiration, but can risk much lower liquidity as expiration nears. For example, a trader who is long four contracts of the E-mini S&P 500 expiring in September will simultaneously sell four September ES contracts and buy four December ES contracts. If a trader has an offset or rolled his position prior to contract expiration, the contract will expire and proceed to settlement. At this point, a trader with a short position will be obligated to deliver the underlying asset under the terms of the original contract. In some markets, this will take the form of physical delivery, and in other markets, will be settled through a cash delivery. You have choices when it comes to expiration with your futures positions. Understanding your options for managing expiration is an important aspect of managing your trading account. So now that you've got your head around how the futures market works, let's go over some main takeaways from step number two. And these are some secrets or things that most people just really don't think through and most people don't talk about. First and foremost, the paper market for all commodities, not just silver, is far larger than the physical market. Also, we can see price discrepancies between the futures market and the price of the physical commodity. We saw this with oil when the barrel, the physical barrels, were trading for, call it, maybe $10, $15 or so, or maybe even $20 in different markets. But the futures price went to almost negative $40 a barrel. Why did this happen? Because there was a lot of buyers, people who bought futures contracts that couldn't take delivery because we had all the storage issues, because we had that glut, that huge supply shock of oil. But it can also happen where the futures 
can go above the price of the commodity if the opposite happened from the standpoint of a lot of people who sold futures in the market couldn't make delivery. So it's either that they can't take delivery, the buyers, or it's the sellers can't make delivery of the physical commodity. And I know a lot of you right about now are saying, okay, great, well, to get back at the banksters, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, let's go ahead and buy futures contracts and demand delivery of the silver in this case. But it doesn't really work that way because a lot of these contracts have a clause where they can just pay you a cash settlement. And then the argument becomes, okay, well, let's just go out and buy physical silver. So there's a big price difference between where the futures contracts are trading and where physical silver is trading. So when the JP Morgan, in this case, rolls their contract over, they've got to buy those futures contracts. They're going to take a huge loss. And although this may happen to a certain extent, remember, it's a zero sum game because the majority of people that are buying these futures contracts aren't necessarily Joe Public. They're Wall Street traders, maybe Goldman Sachs themselves. So if you're hurting JP Morgan, you're helping the counterparty, which most likely is another entity on Wall Street. Also, in a market that's as large as a commodity like silver or like especially oil, it would be very difficult to keep a price spike sustained for a long period of time to where it would actually matter once the expiration date occurs. You'd have to time it perfectly. And we've seen it with silver today that, or yesterday and today where it spikes up quickly, goes down the next day. That's really not hurting any of the people that have sold those futures. It would only hurt them if that price move is occurring during a certain time, getting closer and closer to the expiration date of those contracts. And finally, there might be an argument for going into the options market to buy option because you're able to use so much leverage to control so many futures contracts. So let's say you go into the options market, buy calls. You're buying calls on futures. So there's a lot of leverage there. But the problem is all the market makers that are selling the call options to you in the first place and charging the premium are going to charge a much higher rate because of additional implied volatility because of what happened last week with GameStop. So let me give you a quick example here. And I'm going to take things to an extreme so you can understand how this would work. I gave the example on last week's video of a general contractor, but I'll use some more kind of real numbers using futures or options in this case, excuse me. So let's say you buy an options contract for $1 that gives you control over 500 shares of XYZ stock or maybe 500 futures contracts. So if the price goes from $50 to $55, you have a gain of $5. You've got 500 shares, we'll call it. Therefore, your gain is $2,500. But remember, the price that you're paying for the option or the price the market maker is willing to sell you the option has a lot to do with implied volatility. So if implied volatility is a lot higher, the price of the option is also going to increase. So taking it to an extreme, the market makers obviously don't want to lose money. They're not in the business. It's not a charity for them. So they're going to, let's say, move the price of the option from a dollar up to $2,500. Well, at that point in time, it doesn't make any sense for you to buy the option because you're controlling those 500 shares, which could give you a net gain of $2,500. Why would you pay $2,500 just to get your money back when you've got a lot of risk that comes along with it? No one's going to take that bet. And if they do, it's basically free money for the market makers. And that's why they drive the price up. So my point with all of this is to say the chances of silver getting a short squeeze because of options or because the futures market is so much bigger than the physical market 
it's it's very unlikely. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but the probability of it happening, especially being sustained for a long period of time, is very low. And even if it does happen, it's really not going to hurt Wall Street because it's kind of a zero-sum game. So I'm not saying from a moral or ethical standpoint, you shouldn't be behind the cause. I'm just saying in reality, very unlikely for it to play out the way a lot of us would like it to. Step number three. Now I want to take a step back just for a moment and look at the big picture. There's a lot of emotion and anger I've seen in the media, on my Twitter feed, even in the comments of my videos. For Wall Street, the financial economy, the banksters, the hedge funds, and I totally get it. But I want to make sure that our frustration is directed at the correct entity. Here's what I mean. Let's go back to this timeline that I kind of drew, just made up. It's not a chart. I just kind of pulled this out of my head. <laughs> it goes back to 2000 all the way to 2021, right around where we are today. We kind of know what happened. The Fed came in. We had the dot-com bust. What did they do? They dropped interest rates in an effort to create another speculative bubble to fill in the gap of aggregate demand. That's what their models told them to do, along with individuals like Paul Krugman. <laughs> so they drop interest rates artificially low. And then right before the GFC, we'll call it 2007 or so, they raised interest rates slightly. But this brought on the housing bust. So they drop interest rates artificially low. You combine this with politicians pushing for things like the Community Reinvestment Act. You've got guys like Chris Dodd and Barney Frank saying that banks need to lend to anybody regardless of their credit score or their ability to pay the loan back because the American dream is to own a house. So the banks are pressured to go out there and give that McDonald's worker a loan to buy a million dollar home. Well, the banks don't want anything to do with it. So they take that paper, the loan, and they give it to Fannie and Freddie as quickly as possible. Fannie and Freddie turns it into a mortgage-backed sausage, gives it to Wall Street, and they bundle it up into a collateralized debt obligation or some sort of security. You see what happens. We have this daisy chain that starts with the Fed dropping rates artificially low. There's a lot of bad actors in the process. But without the politicians, the Fed, the central planners, would any of that come to fruition? And I'm referring to the GFC. Okay, well, let's see what happens in 2008. What's their response? Well, as usual, the arsonist is also the firefighter. So they drop rates down to 0%. That's what gave us this ZERP policy. And they started quantitative easing, which dropped the whole yield curve down. So the interest rates on treasuries, everything all the way out to a 30-year treasury, their objective was to get those interest rates down. So effectively, what they did is they took away any yield on safe assets like treasuries that pension funds would typically buy. So what's happening here from 2000 to 2008 is the Fed is pushing investors, pension funds, the average Joe, and hedge funds further out the risk curve. And I would include banks in there. And again, I don't want to let them off the hook. I dislike Wall Street just as much as you do. But again, I want to make sure that we're understanding what happened accurately. I don't want to tell you what you want to hear. I'm always going to tell you what you need to hear. Hopefully, you can appreciate that. So the risk increases, drops down a little maybe during the GFC. But then when we have ZERP quantitative easing, because the entities can't get a yield anywhere, the amount of risk that the Fed is forcing us to take increases it gets greater and greater and greater. This is what gives us the everything bubble till we get to a point right now where the amount of risk taking
goes completely exponential. This is what gives us SPACs, what happens with GameStop and Hertz, where people are literally buying equity of a company that is already bankrupt. So we know what has happened in the past. Now let's go through a thought experiment to see how things may have been different. Let's say that instead of the interest rate going down, the Fed trying to micromanage the economy with their Keynesian economics, that we just had a market rate of 5%. Well, in this case, mortgages most likely would have stayed around 7%. Car loans, let's call it 6%. Treasuries, probably right around 6 to 7% as well, the 10-year treasury. So in this environment, we've got a new timeline here going from 2000 to 2021. Would we have had a housing bubble? If you could have received 6 7% on your money with a 10-year treasury, or if the government wouldn't have forced the Reinvestment Act upon us, wouldn't have pushed the banks to do all of these, let's call them, unqualified loans, <laughs> to say the least, and the financial economy wasn't incentivized to take more and more risk, would we have had the housing bubble? Would we have had the GFC? And if your answer is yes, I would ask you the question, why did we have the GFC in 2008? What made it unique? Why didn't we have a housing crisis in the 1990s? Why didn't we have one in the 1970s or in the 1980s, the 1950s? Pick the decade. From the year 1900 to the year 2000, housing prices adjusted for inflation were pretty much flat. How can you explain the bubble that we had between 2002, call it, and 2008? Was it just the fact that human beings became more greedy? Or those individuals on Wall Street were just exponentially more greedy than they were back in the 1980s and the 1990s? Of course not. There had to be something else at play that created the crash of 2008. And now let's move on to the everything bubble. The same thing, 5% interest rates, mortgage rates at 7%, treasuries at call it 6 or 7%. Would we have seen the stock market go from, let's say on the S&P 500, 1,000 up to almost 4,000? Would we have seen bond prices go to 5,000 year highs? Would we have seen the real economy shrink dramatically while the financial economy gets bigger and bigger and bigger and consumes everything? Would we have seen the rise of SPACs? Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart to see how the money going into these investment vehicles has increased dramatically over the past couple years. Would we see the frenzy with GameStop? Would we see people buying bankrupt companies like Hertz if the Fed never would have dropped interest rates artificially low, done quantitative easing, ZERP, the bailouts, bailing out the repo market, and printing all of these bank reserves, would the last two decades have been any different? I would argue yes. And let's take it another step. The securitization of all of these, we'll call them assets, <laughs> the mortgage-backed sausages. Would we have had that back during the GFC or prior to the GFC? Or what about the euro dollar system that Jeff Snyder would argue was the catalyst for everything crashing in 2008. Would that have gotten out of hand if interest rates never would have gone below 5%? We talked about the financialization of the economy. How about pension funds having to go further and further out the risk curve and they're still not meeting their 7% requirement that they have to have to meet their liabilities to all the policemen, the firefighters, the teachers, the average Joes, would all these pension funds be wildly underfunded if interest rates never went below 5%? Keep in mind, they could have bought treasuries for heaven's sakes 
and got the 6 or 7% they needed in order to meet those liabilities. But instead, what has happened is we no longer have a risk-free rate. There's no risk-free yield. There's no safe assets. You combine that with consumer price inflation going up, we have to take more risk. It turns people from producers into gamblers and creates this entire casino, which is now the world we live in. And I haven't even gotten into all the economic distortions it creates that I talk about all the time, the malinvestment and the misallocation of resources. Let me tell you about a story I saw in Zero Hedge that illustrates this beautifully. It was a person that was angry at the hedge funds, the short sellers, Wall Street, and they were taking their frustration out by buying calls in GameStop. Okay, I get it. And if you continue to read the story, what they say is, I don't care if I lose money because my father started a concrete business in 2005. And the hedge funds came in, created all these mortgage-backed securities that completely imploded the system. Therefore, my father lost his concrete business to the point where we had to scrounge around in the couch just for change to buy gas and put food on the table. And I totally understand the frustration, but this is a perfect example of the Fed and the government creating malinvestment. This gentleman who started the concrete company didn't understand the macroeconomic picture. So all he sees is more and more demand for housing supply, all these homes being built. So he's gonna start this concrete company. He's gonna take his life savings to put it into this business, but it's malinvestment that wouldn't have been there because there never would have been the distortions in the market. It goes back to price signals, remember? That gentleman never would have seen the price of concrete go up and up and up, therefore giving him the signal to start the new business if the Fed never would have dropped interest rates artificially low and the politicians never would have come in to add fuel to the fire. So my whole point is there's plenty of blame to go around, but let's remember it all starts with the Fed and the government, the central planners. Now I'm sure right about now you're probably asking yourself, okay, George, what does this have to do with silver booming again or continuing to crash? Well, I'm glad you asked. To answer that question, to give you my opinion of what may happen, is I personally, again, there's no certainties, only probabilities, but I think the price of silver over the long run, the next five years, the next 10 years, will most likely boom. But I don't think it's going to be because of a short squeeze. I think it's going to be because of the distortions the Fed has created because of the money printing, because of the MMT, because of all the insanity of the central planners and what they're gonna be doing over the next five years. I think there's a strong fundamental case for silver long-term and what we're seeing now with this short squeeze is just merely a sideshow. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.